she is a professor in Stock at Stockholm University, and she is working with uh, quantum light sources, entangled photon generation, and uh, microphone on. I think microphone yes. is on, correct? Yes. So you hear me? Okay. Good. So she's also a member of the Future Council of the uh, World Economy Economic Forum on Quantum Computation, like Thomas Mons. But I think she will talk a bit more about her current research mm -hmm. on uh, light sources, uh, entangled photon light sources. Okay. So. Thank you. So indeed, I will talk today about quantum light sources. And um, do you hear me well? Yeah. So I, I'm a little bit like dynamic when I speak. So if the thing starts to move, let me know. So I can readjust it for better tone. So um, yes, I will talk today about light sources. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, some things that maybe do not have a direct connection with the quantum computing. But I will also tell you about how we make light sources. And this type of light sources is the, for example, was the, the driving um, mechanism for um, uh, experiments like, for example, the boson sampling, uh, large boson sampling circuits. They have been driven by quantum light that was produced by quantum dots. So I will tell you how such sources can be made and how they can be characterized. And given the fact that I've seen also a little bit of your background, I will give you at the end also a little bit of, of something different on the characterization of the um, light sources. So let me start. I will tell you a bit about um, entangled photon pairs, because this is something that we do a lot in our lab. And then I will introduce to you a novel device, actually two novel devices, that uh, can serve for generation of entangled photon pairs. They can also be used for generation of single photons. They can be also used for generation of large uh, cluster states in, in light, which are element, the necessary element for measurement based quantum computing. And at the end, I will tell you a little bit about the entanglement characterization. So let me slowly dive in. Um, approximately 60% of our activities in Stockholm are based on generation of quantum light using quantum dots. And I think it's in order to tell you why we use quantum dots. And um, both very important characteristics of quantum dots are bound to their structure, their energetic structure. So quantum dots, they are like um, atom-like systems, but they are placed in semiconductor environment. So there, uh, the function of, of certain, I will show you how they, they are made and how they're grown. So the, uh, out, uh, the final product of this semiconductor system is a two-level or a three-level system that we can then address as if it was an atom. And since they are atom-like, you can drive them resonantly and coherently. And as you can drive them resonantly and coherently, you can induce Rabi oscillations. As a consequence, you can get a very, very efficient source of single photons, and I will show you also later of uh, photon pairs. That is, I would say, in the generation, uh, nearly deterministic. So they have very high photon generation probability. To back this claim, I will show you here this measurement. This is a Rabi oscillation measured on a bi-exciton photon of a resonantly excited quantum dot. And you can see on the x-axis, we can have, we have here the laser pulse area. And if we correctly choose the pulse area of the pulse, then we can see that on the y-axis, the emission probability can become very high. And here emission probability is 0 0.9. And I can tell you that this quantum dot was driven with a laser with a rep rate of 80 megahertz, which means that we were making 72 million photon pairs in our case, but it can be also 72 million photons, or you can, if you do some tricks, make 72 million entangled photon pairs per second. And this is a lot. 
Another important property of quantum dots is that since they are atom-like, they're a little bit different to um, a competing uh, technology, which is uh, spontaneous parametric down conversion, because there is a completely different statistics in place. So we have a very anti-bunched and very sub poissonian statistics. And to also back this claim, so this is an autocorrelation function measured on the same signal on which we measured the Rabi oscillations and on the pi pulse. And as you can see, we have nearly no signal at the zero delay, which means that if we for one second forget that an autocorrelation measurement will not tell us anything about the source efficiency, this is the closest that you can get to an ideal single photon source. And then what do we use the lies from quantum dots? So as I said, we can make single photons if we treat them as a two-level system. And then if you have several such sources and you can recycle all of these photons, then you can make experiments of boson sampling. And the most uh, elaborated, most successful experiments of boson sampling were made using quantum dots in micropillar cavities. Very similar to one I'm gonna show you today. Also, if you uh, drive um, um, lambda system in quantum dots, we have between a dark state and a bright state, you can make uh, an entangled cluster state. So you can constantly drive the quantum dot between the two, uh, one long living and one short living level, and you can make a cluster state and such a cluster state can actually, and I think it's gonna be shown in the next year, can be fused with another cluster state to make 2D cluster state. And this is, well, I say, fairly enough to do the measurement-based quantum computation. The third product is uh, photon pairs, and that is when you consider a quantum dot to be a three-level system. So what we do a lot in the lab, we look at these three-level systems, and the reason for that is that there we can get entangled photon pairs. The idea for the experiment is um, very similar to the original uh, experiment by Alan Aspe, where you have uh, an excited state, an intermediate state, and a ground state, and you have then a cascade. This cascade is called the bi-exciton exciton cascade, it's temporally ordered, so first the bi-exciton photon be emitted, then the exciton. And in principle, you can use this cascade to generate polarization entangled photon pairs. How is this possible? Well, there are two decay paths from the excited to the ground state. I mark them here in orange and in green. And these two um, decay paths, they will emit you a pair of photons, and this photon pair, the, so the two different decay paths, will have orthogonal polarizations, which means I mark them here with H and a V, so which means we can get uh, two photons that are either H or V polarized. If this intermediate level is not split, I have plotted it here split, and I will tell you in a moment why. If this level here is degenerate, then you cannot tell from the energy of these photons was it one or the other cascade, and by default, you will get polarization entangled photon pairs. So this is the first proposed system for generation of entangled photon pairs using quantum dots, but this is not all that you can do. You can also generate the time in entanglement, in quantum dots, and there you have to prepare your quantum system in a superposition by being excited either by early or a late pulse. I will tell you a little bit more about it. So it's a time in entanglement, which is um, uh, very relevant for, for quantum networks because the time in entanglement is a, a very good type of encoding for transmission of entanglement through optical fibers. Also, you can mix and match. So you can make uh, entanglement in a larger number, larger degrees of, um, more degrees of freedom. So in polarization and timing together, for example, and get the hyper entanglement, which is interesting for dense coding and uh, uh, complete bell measurement using only linear optical components. So let me tell you a little bit about the structure of quantum dots to explain this splitting here, which we call the fine structure splitting. 
So quantum dots, in essence, they are um, physical in implementation of an ideal uh, 3D potential well. So they are formed by strain. You have commonly two materials. Here you have gallium arsenide and indium arsenide. And these two materials, they have different band gap. And they have very similar lattice constant. So when you have <coughs> gallium arsenide here, and you have several monolayers of indium arsenide on top of it, this indium arsenide tries to, to fit in the lattice of gallium arsenide. And since their lattice are not of the same size, it will strain a bit, and the strain will relax, and it will bulge up, and will form this, which we call a quantum dot. This quantum dot is capped on top, again, with gallium arsenide. And the property of a quantum dot, property of this strain-induced structure, is that you will have a potential wells in its energy landscape. And these potential wells, they will be having uh, such a dimension that it's comparable with the De Broglie wavelength of the electrons and the holes in the semiconductor material. And therefore, these electrons and holes, they can be trapped in the quantum dot potential. What happens is that a quantum dot actually doesn't mind how many carriers it's going to trap. There are various configurations. But the most interesting tool for us is an electron hole pair which when it recombines gives a single photon, or two electron hole pairs that give us this, this beautiful cascade. What is also important to mention is that this strain induced process, it is stochastic. So these uh, bulges of quantum dots, they will form like water droplets on, on, on the glass. So at the places where they want to form, as you can see them here. And this, uh, I want to show it to you because this is kind of quite relevant for what I want to show you later. And just as one small word of introduction, um, here is um, a whole zoo of different states that you can form. You can have an electron hole pair or two electron hole pairs, an electron hole pair and an electron hole pair and a, and a hole. So there's a lot of different combinations. And these states commonly form if you excite the quantum dot, what is called in a bow band excitation. A bow band excitation does not have anything to do with the story about atoms and Rabi oscillation that I told you at the beginning. It simply means that you use a laser that has an energy that is much, much, much larger to, than any transition in, in quantum dot. And then you will actually act on the material around in this material, you will lift up the carriers. You will give them energy. And these, and these, uh, these carriers, they will then bounce around. We have various phonon transition and eventually get trapped in the quantum dot potential. And that is a way to excite the quantum dot and to probe what you get out of it. And I'll give you here an example. This is an emission spectrum and shows you an exciton. So single electron hole pair. A bi-exciton, well, it's the first pair here. This is a trion. This is a charged trion. So you can get various states emitted by quantum dot. However, for the purposes of, of quantum optics and quantum technologies, you commonly want to drive your quantum dots resonantly. And we will come to that in, in, in a few moments. So getting back to entanglement, I told you that we mostly do in the lab time in entanglement. And there's a good reason for that. Yes? Uh, so, uh, in the, 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 the next slide, uh, how is it possible to differ the origin of the radiation between the, the single excitation and the discovered discharge mode? Because they are very composed. In the so, this is an example. So, you can, here you can still distinguish it. This is not a problem. So here, I, mean, I do know that it looks very, very close to each other. In principle, we would not choose this emitter to work with. We would choose one where all the lines are very separate to each other. But this was the only example where I had the charge by exciton to show to you. So to, that, that I show you that you have all these lines. In principle, 
when you start to work with quantum dot emitters, you will get a lot of spectra that look like this. And then you need to test which line is which line. So if you just see the spectrum, you will not know which line is which line. You need to do a lot of autocorrelation, cross-correlation measurement, put this in the magnetic field, take it out of the magnetic field. So you have to do a lot of investigation to identify the various lines. And commonly, you will work with a quantum dot where the lines are clearly possible to separate. In this case, I'm pretty sure that we would be able to separate it to identify it, but I'm not sure if we would be able to perform further experiments with it. Okay. So, going back to the entanglement. So, mostly we work with time and entanglement, and I told you before, one good reason for that is that time in encoding is good for distributing entanglement through optical fibers. And the reason for that is, for example, if you have polarization entangled photon pairs, the optical fibers are birefringent. So if you let these photons that are entangled in polarization travel for all many kilometers, they will essentially walk on each other, become distinguishable, and your entanglement will die. However, this does not happen with time in. So many time when you hear about um, distribution of entanglement over 200, 300, 600 kilometer using an optical fiber, we are talking about either time in or time energy entanglement. And for us, it's also important that we do not need to eliminate this fine structure splitting. This fine structure splitting, it comes from what I showed you two slides before, this, uh, the way how we, we get the quantum dots through, the way how this growth happens we are strain. What is characteristic is that the quantum dots, they are not, uh, they're not round. When you look from the top, they're not round. They're a little bit elliptical. And due to that, due to this induced strain, which is um, a remaining artifact from the growth process, you usually have the fine structure split. There are ways to eliminate it. I'm not going to talk about them today. But in principle, each and every quantum dot, in order to get the polarization entanglement, polarization entanglement photon bears out of it, you need to eliminate fine structure splitting. However, you do not need to do that for time and entanglement because you can work with only one cascade. OK? And to add also on, a, on the topic of quantum computing, you can also have time and entanglement, time and encoding used for linear optical quantum computing. For that, you would need uh, time in larger states or registered, uh, registers of time in entangled states where you have several um, time bin slots that are entangled to each other, and you can use them for the linear optical quantum computing. Let me tell you a little bit how time bin entanglement is generated. Well, how we do it in a lab is, is rather simple. Uh, we use a, shall I say, a rather old scheme, but good enough for us. So we need an interferometer to create this early in the late pulse. So for example, you have an, a TISAF laser, an 80 megahertz laser, and then you send this laser through an unbalanced interferometer. And an output of the interferometer, you will get then two pulses, an early pulse and a late pulse. So if you drive your system in such a way that it's either excited by the early or by the late pulse, you get a superposition of the system either being excited early or either being late, excited by the late pulse. So let's look now what happens with the photon that is generating quantum. So for example, the bi-exciton photon that reaches this detector. So if it was an early pulse that generated the photon and the photon went down the short path of this interferometer, then we talk about a short, short situation. And from the arrival time, you can already say, OK, this photon came very early, so it must have been the early pulse that generated it. If you excite the quantum dot with the late pulse, then you, and it, the photon goes down the long path here, then from the arrival time, you can already say, oh, it was long, long, because it arrives very late. But an interesting combination is if you have an early excitation pulse, and then the photon comes down the long part, arm of this interferometer, or vice versa. Because there you cannot tell was it early or a late pulse that generated this, this, uh, this photon. And um, if you can post-select these events, then you will be able to observe an entangled state in time in there. 
This is a, a little bit old scheme. You can also do it with fast switching. Uh, this is maybe easier to imagine. If you can do the fast switching, then you do not need to do the post selection. And everything that reaches your detectors will be entangled in time. Uh, we use, usually do this using uh, interferometers, and this is, for example, how such an interferometer looks like in a lab with lots of beams coming in and coming out. A little note on this, um, very important, I would say, for the last part of the talk. Commonly, if we want to uh, characterize how much our photons are entangled, we will do state tomography. We're going to find how our density matrix looks like, and then we're going to do, uh, we're going to look at the certain indicators or measures of entanglement. So an indicator as a fidelity to a maximal entangled state, or a measure of entanglement such as concurrence. You don't need to stop here. As I said, you can go to larger states. You can make hyperentangled state in time in, and polarization and so on. So this gets a little bit uh, larger density matrix and you need to do more measurement. Before I go to the, the structures and to the, the devices that we recently developed, let me show you uh, for a second how we coherently drive quantum dots. So do we go back to that Rabi oscillation. So to drive the quantum dots coherently to get photon pairs out, you do what is called a two photon resonant excitation of the bioexciton. So what I can show you here, this is the emission spectrum of a quantum dot. You can see here the exciton and the bioexciton. So this is the first photon of the cascade. This is the second photon of the cascade. Important to say is that these two photons, they will not have the same energy. Because when you have two electron hole pairs that are forming the bioexciton, they are having a Coulomb interaction between them. So when the first photon is emitted, then the, the energy will shift, and you will have two uh, photons emitted in this cascade, and they will not have the same energy. But this is good for us, because we can drive a two-photon process from ground to the bioexciton state. And this two-photon process, you can see here the laser scattering will be exactly halfway between these two energies, and it will not overlap with our emission, with our signal. And this is good. So if you want to look at this uh, process a little bit more in detail, you can solve this master equation. Here is where you can find all the details of it. And you can learn a little bit about the decoherent processes, about Rabi oscillations, and how this whole system functions. What I would like to tell you is that one needs to be a little bit um, careful about the, the pulse that you use here. So it should not be too broad. It should not be too short. Because you can, aside from this two-photon uh, process, so driving the, the quantum dot from the ground to the excited state, to the bioexciton state via this two-photon resonant excitation, you can also off-resonantly drive this exciton. It depends on how well you have chosen your pulse. If your pulse is very short, it means very broad, you can then off-resonantly end up driving this exciton. And we also did a study here, where we look at the 4 picosecond and the 12 picosecond pulse. A 4 picosecond pulse is much broader. It's much shorter, but spectrally broader. And the 12 picosecond pulse is a longer, but spectrally narrower. And the 12 picosecond pulse was more able to drive us the two-photon resonant excitation than this unwanted off-resonant excitation of the exciton. So those are a little bit of experimental tricks. Thomas would like to call this dirty experimental tricks. There's nothing dirty about it, but uh, it's, it's a good experimental trick. OK. So I will just s jump over one slide and go to the devices. So um, maybe to get the best out of this story about devices, let me go to the first slide. So the, on the first slide, I told you, well, we have this two-level or three-level system. We can drive this coherently. We can drive this resonantly. We can induce the Rabi oscillations. We can get 72 million photon pairs. Great numbers. What I didn't tell you is if you just have a quantum dot in a semiconductor material, uh, due to the fact that you have a, a very high refractive index material and the quantum dot will emit in full solid angle, you will usually not get more than 
of the light going upwards. So that makes it, again, not very efficient source. But this can be solved if you build around a quantum dot a photonic structure, a photonic structure that will allow this light to be collected and directed into your detection system. And this is what is commonly done today. Uh, I have to say that this problem has been beautifully solved for collection of single photons by using micropillar cavity. So I go back to the boson sampling uh, experiment. I can tell you for boson sampling, they have used uh, moderate to high Q-factor micropillar cavities, and they were able to get a very large number of photons. The percentage was, I think, I don't want to give numbers, but you can check it. Approximately maybe 80% of, of light can be sent upwards. But this problem is not solved if you want to work with photon pairs. And this picture here can show you immediately what is the problem. We have an exciton, and we need to have a bi-exciton, and we would like to collect both of these photons. Means that we need to have a solution that is sufficiently broadband to collect both of the photons. So uh, we have worked on many different structures on this. So uh, we started with um, micro, uh, with um, uh, nanowires while I was still in Innsbruck. Then we went via circular Bragg rating cavities, these funky um, tapered structures. We, we, we have colleagues in Germany that fabricate this, and we have given it the name a beer glass cavity, very popular there, because it does really do look like a, a glass of, of beer. And then these two structures that I'm going to talk about today, these are um, planar micro cavities with a, with, a, with a dimple, with a curved top DBR. And these are the low Q micro pillars. And here I will start with this solution because this solution is, from a point of view of fabrication, very, very uh, simple and very scalable. So I have here a little bit funny and not very physical picture because I was using this during the, during the corona time for, for Zoom. And uh, like, I like to explain this with my hands and my you know, camera doesn't capture all wide angles, so I needed some help. So what happens here is that we want to put a quantum dot in, in a cavity. We want to use a cavity to help us mediate the photons upwards in the detection system. So when you make a, a planar cavity, which means you put a DBR on the bottom, and then you put a quantum dot layer in the middle, and the DBRs on the top. So what happens is when the quantum dot forms, it deforms the material, deforms the lattice around. And if this cavity is, uh, for example, a lambda cavity, if it's not very thick, well, then your top DBR are not going to be flat. And some people will say, okay, this is bad. And I'll say, that, no, it's not bad. It's good because it makes these oval-shaped dimples on the top that work as some sort of a combination between a, a lens and a, and a top mirror cavity. And then allow us to form here a mode volume. When we form a mode volume, then we can mo change how much light actually couples to the system because we start to enter here in cavity quantum electrodynamics. And we can uh, direct the light more in the cavity mode than other directions where the quantum dot would emit. So we started here by looking at the simulation. And in this simulation, uh, well, our, our collaborators, they, they, well, they haven't really looked at the, at the pretty shape of a dome. They looked at it simply as, as a step above the, the quantum dot with the height h and the diameter d. And they've seen that, well, having such a surrounding for a quantum dot, we should get a, a modest Purcell factor. Tell me. Yes.
Yes? There's the ball. Sorry, I, I, I didn't, I, acoustically I didn't ah, understand okay, you, so yes. can you tell me one more time? So it's just because, uh, well, actually I'm just thinking that this whole thing looks a bit for me like a, like a exchange, just like fractal quantum hall effect, that there's a hole, and there are things like that, but, but actually I just wanted to know like where exactly are these holes of, um, like, like to have really holes of, uh, of atoms, like, like uh, inside these layers, like, like so, so what you have here is simply it's material, and in this material you will have a potential well. The reason why you have a potential well is because the strain changes at this point in the material, and you will simply have a potential well there, and the energy, so the size of this potential well, is matching the 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 Broglie wavelength of the of the carriers. The carriers are everywhere around. So you, you have a semiconductor material. So you can, you can shine a, a flashlight on it. You will bring some carriers, you will give some carriers from the, the, the valence to conductive band. They will have their energy. They will be able to move around, even just if you use a flashlight. And you could, with the flashlight, make your quantum dot emit. You will not see Rabi oscillations, of course. For that, you need a resonant excitation and a, and a coherent laser and, and all the, the quantum optics toolkit. But in essence, you can excite a quantum dot with a flashlight, with a room light, no problem. OK? You said when, I, when you have the two of these things, what things? Yes, like a, well, like a, like a, like, like two, two holes of, um, I think it's about, uh, like, a, well, the statistics of this part of practice about the frequency of the, mm -hmm. about the interface. Is there, any, like, like, is it, is it only dependent on, uh, yeah. So Temperature. Yeah, this I is all at four Kelvin. Ah, uh, okay, so it's not, not many things. <laughs> four Kelvin. Semiconductors, if you want semiconductors to work, 4 Kelvin and below. So 4 Kelvin, we are good. Other things need 300 millikelvin, okay? So, good. So, uh, where was I? Cavities. Good. So, would we observe that we should have um, the structure that we get on the top should help us collect more photons, will help us see per cell effect. And indeed, when we looked at it, uh, we observed it. So we can see per cell enhancement between one, uh, 1.2 to 1.7. We've seen a collection efficiency of nearly 17%, um, which is then 17 times better than 1% that you usually get. I have to say that this is the, the number that we published in the paper. Later on, when we looked a little bit more around and we, we worked with more emitters, we have seen the collection efficiencies uh, of nearly 30%, which is, it is so much better. What is important here is actually this picture, which maybe doesn't mean so much to you, but it's, it's very important. These dimples, they form at every place where a quantum dot forms. So if they have the same resonant frequency as a quantum dot, which can be fairly organized within few nanometers difference, you will always get an emitter. And this is very nice because this is very scalable from fabrication point of view because you make one wafer and you have a lot of these dimples and then if I want to give one dimple to you and one to you and one to you and one to you, I just take the wafer and I cut it in four. So this is very nice and very scalable. Um, having said this, um, I also want to show that we looked in the time in entanglement. We looked also that our emission is very, very clean because this is what you need to do. When you put a structure, you need to still check if the quantum dot behaves as a quantum dot. And we have seen a time in entanglement with a concurrence of something like 0 0.7 and fidelity of 0.84. So this was one <coughs> source. 
Well, let me tell you something about a, a different one. Just one second. Well, water is highly needed here. So this, is, this other source is what we call the low Q micropillar. Why is this important? Why, why do I say low Q micropillar? Because commonly no one makes micropillars to be a low Q factor. The reason for that is, and we go back to boson sampling. If you want to extract single photons, you will make a moderate to high Q factor cavity. Then these cavities, they will have a line width of approximately half a nanometer. But what will happen is that you will have a very strong Purcell factor inside. And this Purcell factor will drive high collection efficiency. I'll show you in the next slide why. Okay, next slide why. And it was generally believed that if now someone decides to make a low Q micropillar cavity, that we will lose all of these pretty properties and we will not be able to collect a light. And why do we want a low Q micropillar cavity? Could you elaborate a bit more what is Q factor and what is the source of factor? So Q factor comes to us from semiconductor physics from laser physics. Because the diet lasers, they are placed in the cavities. And now, uh, if you want to define parameters of the cavities, and lasers can be at various wavelengths, you want uh, a, a way to describe the cavities around them and how they emit that is not wavelength dependent. So what you use in that case is the Q factor. And Q factor is, I think, delta lambda over lambda or other way around, I'm not really sure, is delta nu over nu or delta lambda over lambda. You can look at it. Wikipedia knows it much better than me. And uh, with this, you will be able to, to quantify how good is the cavity. If the cavity is a high finesse cavity, then it has a large Q factor. If it's a low finesse cavity, it has a low Q factor. So if you make a high finesse cavity, you're going to make this cavity to be narrow, and you're going to get in it, if you have a small mode volume, you can get a high Purcell factor. However, if you make the cavity to not have a high finesse, you lose these parameters, but what do you get? You get it to be broader. You get it to be broader so we can accommodate this exciton and the bi-exciton that we want to get out. Okay? And uh, here it is. An important element, and this also comes from laser physics, from, uh, the, the fit, from very classical photonics. The important element here is the so-called beta factor. The beta factor tells you, if you have an emitter in a structure, how, what is the percentage of the light that you couple to your cavity of all the light that the emitter emits? So if you have a beta factor of one, that means that all the light that your emitter has emitted has been emitted outside of the device mediated by the cavity. And uh, you will find this uh, equation very often. But what is interesting is that very often you will find in the denominator the second term is going to be equal to one. If that term here would be equal to one, and Fp is the Purcell factor, if you do not have a Purcell factor, your beta factor is limited to 50%. And therefore, it was believed that if you cannot make a high Q micropillar, like the ones that were used for boson sampling uh, sources, then um, it will not be possible to collect the photons. However, uh, this is not the case, and here, this term is what changes the situation. Because uh, if you say that it, uh, your beta factor depends only on the Purcell factor, that means that when you place the cavity, you, so let's put it the other way around. If we, before you place the cavity around the emitter, you have some rate of emission, and we call that a bulk rate. However, when you place the cavity, even if you do not make any Purcell effect 
at the resonance of the cavity, you suppress the modes that are not resonant to the cavity. So you do have some suppression there. And if you have the ratio between what, how the, the, your, your system will look like if you have no cavity and how you suppress the modes, you literally force the light to go with the cavity. Okay. So what we did here, we have studied this experimentally and uh, what we call um, deterministic loquel cavities. And let me show you here why we call them deterministic. And this is very important for, for micropillar cavities and any photonic devices in general. Is when you, I, I showed you that these quantum dots, they form in a, in a stochastic manner. So you do not know where your quantum dot is going to be. But you want to put a structure on the top. So this, the logic there is that you need to understand where your quantum dot is and then place the structure. That's what we call them deterministic. And how do you do this? Well, you have these uh, golden masks. And then you're going to find where your emitter is. And then you're going to triangulate the position with respect to the mask. And how you're going to triangulate? Of course, you're going to see no signal, no signal, no signal, signal, no signal. The stronger is your signal to noise ratio, the higher is the precision. So if you have um, a nice cavity already to start with, a planar cavity, then you're going to have a very strong signal to align where you're going to place, the, 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 where you're going to edge the micro cavity. And here we can get this with the accuracy of less than 30 nanometers, which is pretty good. So what we studied was the number of uh, cavities. They were all having a low Q factor, so they were designed to be um, with Q factor between 200 and 300, which are approximately five nanometers width. And then we looked in the various pillar diameters. Why various pillar diameters? Comes on the next slide. So from a theoretical study of the system, and the theoretical study was done in FTDT, so we looked at the, at the emitter in a structure, and then we looked how much light goes along the axis of a pillar, how much light is going to go to the side, so box the R emitter. And we looked at how much light theoretically should be sent up with the cavity. And what we have found out is that the beta factor should actually be quite high. Look, even up to 0 0.9. However, there is this oscillatory behavior with the micropillar diameter. So this, what is happening, easier to show on, on the left figure. So here we have the cavity mode in black. This is the higher order mode. You can forget about it. It's very hard to anyway see it on a on spectrometer, so we can forget about this one. This is a cavity mode. And this shows us the light that will go upwards via cavity. This red line is what we call the side mode. It's the light that will go sideways from the pillar. And here, what you can see is the pillar diameter. So I'm going to change now the pillar diameter. I'm going to go 55, 60, 65. What happens sideways is that at the certain pillar diameters, you form a mode also in, in that direction. OK. Thank you. You see, I told you that I was quite dynamic. Good? Bad? OK? Could be better? It's OK, OK, fine. So what happens here is that you also form a cavity-like structure, form a mode in sideways direction. And this sideways direction steals your light. You can see this as, as a beam splitter, a phase of an interferometer and a beam splitter. So how you change the phase, you can either send all the light one, down one output of an interferometer, or you can split it down the two outputs. And this is, uh, depends on the diameter of the pillar and, of course, the wavelength, because it, it has to be related to the wavelength of the light. And in this case, we will have most of the light actually leaving sideways. And this is 65 micron, uh, 1.65 micron pillar. 
There it is. So it's a low bit effect. However, when we start increasing the diameter, again, we lose the mode, and everything mostly goes upwards. OK, so um, let me tell you a little bit about the, the result. So once we have seen these, these micro pillars, then we wanted to estimate, OK, how much of the light actually gets up, so how, how, how much of beta factor we're going to get. And we measured all the relevant parameters, how many counts we have, what are the losses, what is an NA, how, how much well we excited, and so on and so on. And we have found out that we have a collection efficiency of nearly 70%. So what does this mean for a broadband solution? So this is one of the three best results in the field. It's the only one made in Europe. The other two were made in China. And the other two were made on, a, on a drug rating cavities. Uh, however, so if I can advertise something uh, here, uh, the solution that we have with these low Q cavities, this is uh, simpler, much simpler to fabricate than the circular Bragg rating cavities. Circular Bragg rating cavities, um, I'm not going to go many slides back, but they go from this uh, circle, 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 and those are very fine structures with very, very small dimensions, and you need good um, fabrication uh, facilities to make them. And you need to make a lot of them before one works. This solution with just making a, a micro pillar of approximately two micron, but understanding what diameter, this is simple lithography. This is a solution for every continent. Right? So this is really simple to do. And what we notice is that we have a very high yield of functional devices. So, which means if the quantum dot responds to the light, nearly all of the, the, the micro pillars work, which is also very good. We looked also that we have entanglement in such structures. And what is even more important, we wanted to understand why do we have only 70%, because the beta factor was like 0 0.8, 0 0.9, something like that. And we understood that um, um, it goes along the cavity, but not everything goes upwards. Some things also go down. So if you pick a, a substrate with this low uh, refractive index, like, like we, we show here, then you can get uh, structures that are going to be over 80% collection, over 2 nanometers, which is, I would say, not so bad. Okay. Having said this, uh, let me just show you on maybe two, three slides, a few measurements that we needed to do to confirm all of this, and then I will go to the third topic. So um, let me just show you here. This is our emission, which is resonant to the cavity. You see large counts here on the, on the y-axis. And this is the emission. So you actually have to look into the zoom in here. The emission when we do not have the cavity, when, when the cavity is very uh, detuned with respect to the emitter which is telling you that on the cavity resonance, we really get a lot of light. But when the, light, when the quantum dot is not resonant to the cavity, we get very, very little. And this also confirms what I was saying at the beginning, that there is a huge difference between being resonant to the cavity and not being resonant, even if it's a low-Q cavity. We also looked uh, theoretically at this. So this is what we expected as efficiency. And you can see somewhere around 70%, as I told you. And we also look here, theoretically, what is expected uh, efficiency. And this quantum dot was around 930. Look, nothing there in theory, nothing there in the experiment. Fantastic. We also wanted to test, do we have per cell factor? Because I'm telling you all of this, OK, you can get a very high collection efficiency without a per cell factor. Uh, well, we also looked at that. So I see here a difference in the lifetime of nearly a half. But this does not really come from us having a per cell factor. Where does it come from? It comes from when you're not resonant to the cavity, you're actually suppressed. The emission is suppressed. So when we look at the emission outside, uh, theoretically, it's predicted that the emission, that the per cell factor should be 0 0.5 outside the cavity. So you would have like a twice slower emission outside the cavity. And inside the cavity, our prediction, for example, for this two micro pillar here, 
is around 1.5, not so much, or around 1. So there is not really for self. If you're a little bit worried about these spikes here, that you get high for cell, they're not there. <laughs> Physically, they're not there. The FTDT tells you, oh, you're going to have a beautiful enhanced emission. The computer said you're going to have beautiful emission there. What happens here, we have these beautiful per cell factors is that your, your simulation simply is not able to distinguish between emission upward and emission sideways. And it sees all of it together. It's, oh, you're going to have a beautiful per cell factor. No, I don't. Because as you can see, these blue regions and these peaks in per cell factor, they are matching these dips in, in beta factor. All right? So this is, don't always trust the computer when the computer does the simulation. So it's going to be beautiful per cell enhancement. No, it's not going to be there. OK. Having said this, let me go to a completely different topic. Four slides on that. Um, it's about entanglement characterization. So uh, I don't know if you are familiar with entanglement characterization. You, I mean, if you are at this school, you should be a little bit familiar. Okay. Uh, this is not so easy. It's actually far from easy. There's a whole field that deals with the uh, entanglement uh, characterization. And what happens, for example, when we he have these devices, when we have our quantum dots, if we want to learn if this device can give us entangled photon pairs, what do we need to do? We need to measure, we need to do the full state tomography. We need to reconstruct the density matrix. And once we have this density matrix, then we can apply various measures to learn how much entanglement we have in the system. And you can say, okay, this is easy. I mean, you have two qubits. Uh, it's a photonic qubit. So you're going to measure the full basis of three Pauli operators, which is uh, six measurements to the number of qubits squared, 36 measurements. I mean, what are you talking about? However, when you start to go to the larger number of qubits, the number explodes. Because the number of measurements you need to do for full state tomography for photonic qubits, it's 6 to the n, where n be either number of qubits or number of dimensions. So if you have three qubits, you immediately go to 216 measurements. It's a whole fun, whole week in the lab. Okay. And what is interesting is that there are many ways to reconstruct the state. And the, I would say probably the most, maybe not the most novel, but the most popular is the maximum likelihood. And the maximum likelihood is an iterative method. So you will have data, you will have the measurement description, and you will start from some initial guess. And bit by bit, through this uh, maximum likelihood iterative method, you will come to the state that mostly, most accurately represents what you have measured in a lab. But there are a few problems with this. First of all, you need a complete set of measurements. So you need to do full state tomography. Or you need to make assumptions about the state. So you, I can say that you don't need to do the full state tomography, but you need to assume some elements about your state. For example, if you don't want to do 36 measurements, you can do 16 for two qubits. But then you need to uh, uh, assume that you have the bias basis. So yeah, some things can be done here. However, if you have made an incomplete measurement, then the accuracy of which we can estimate how much entanglement you have goes fast, re, goes bad really, really fast. And as you can imagine, if we have 6 to the n, and then the number of qubit or dimension, this is inherently not scalable. So what we wanted to see is, can we have, uh, can neural networks actually help us? Can machine learning help us? So what we wanted to do is, can we quantify quantum correlation? I'm going to call them here quantum correlations, because also the, the quantifiers of entanglement, they are a complicated story. Because for two qubit entanglement, you can have concurrence. This is not a problem. And the concurrence is uh, <clears throat> rotation invariant. But you cannot, for example, uh, you, don't, you cannot really define concurrence already with three qubits. So, what we said, we're going to have a 
we're going to measure quantum correlations, so how much entanglement we have in the system. For two qubits, we looked for concurrence, and for the larger number of qubits for mutual information. Tell me. Define under which conditions you can do minimal state tomography. Uh, just four measurement, four measurements instead of six. Okay. Under which conditions you can do that? What do you need to assume? Uh, uh, and can you refer which measurements you're referring to? Uh, counts. Yes. Yeah, but this is not a, 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 a full basis. So what do you need? Do you need to make an assumption if you go to four yes. measurement? Do you need to assume something about the measurement? I, I don't quite remember. I just got confused. Well, you, you do have to uh, assume. And, and I mean, OK, in, in a very hand-waving description, when you, when you want to go to do instead of 36 to do 16 measurements, you need to assume that your density matrix is symmetric along the diagonal. So you need to assume. You, you, can, you, you can always reduce something. OK, you can, I can reduce here. I can chop here. I can crop there. But you always need to make an assumption. You need to a priori know something about the state. If you do not know a priori about the state, it doesn't go so easy. OK? Uh, where was I? Concurrence and mutual information. So, um, yeah, two qubits, concurrence. When we pass the two qubits, the concurrence doesn't help us anymore, so we need to look something else. And then we were interested in using incomplete set of measurements, but not assuming anything about the state, which is the, the, the important thing for us. And the last thing is to be that these uh, deep neural networks can be trained using simulated data so that we do not need to struggle now with how we're going to produce the data. And we looked into two approaches. One is what we call measurement specific, and the other one measurement independent. The measurement specific is where you already know which, in, which set of incomplete measurements you're going to take. So you a priori know, OK, I'm going to be measuring only 12 measurements, for example, and there's going to be these ones. Or you have a measurement independent, and then you have a data and the measurement description. But then you have a first convolutional layer there, of course, in neural network. OK. And let's see how the, this works. And we, maybe something that I forgot is very important. We do not want to reconstruct the density matrix. We simply want to know either concurrence or mutual information. We want to give our measurements, incomplete measurements in, and that the thing spits out the concurrence or mutual information without any reconstructions. Now, the result. OK, what we have here is number of projective measurements for two qubits. 36 is full tomography. Here we have three qubits, number of projection measurements. The full tom uh, tomography is 216. Okay. Mean absolute error. If we have full state tomography, we can find out what is the concurrence or the mutual information. We can calculate exactly from 36 or 216. Therefore, if we talk about error, here the error is very, very small on the order of 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 6. Because if you have 36 measurements and you use maximum likelihood, you will very, very, very well guess. I mean, not guess. You will very well calculate what is your concurrence and what's your mutual information. However, now you start to take the measurements out. And you look at the difference between the, the outcome that you got and what you get from a full state tomography. And as you can see here, as we reduce the number of measurements, the error grows. 
So the concurrence is a measure which is one for maximally entangled state, zero for maximally mixed state. If you have very few measurements, you're going to have an error of, or have a wrong value that is going to differ by 0 0.2, and it's a lot. The same case for three qubits. So what you have here in blue is the uh, measurement independent, and what you have in green is uh, measurement specific neural network. And as you can see, and I'm specifically proud here to this result, you can considerably reduce the number of measurements that you need to take. And it's much better than the maximum likelihood. And it's on the trained data. And uh, what we did here is we also want to say, okay, if I have now a real source, and the real source will have its um, special properties. So we might have some statistical errors in when we collect the data that are going to be only specific for the source. Let's take the real life data and test it. So we took a source of spontaneous paramagnetic down conversion with a beautiful concurrence of 98, very nicely sampled data, a lot of counts. And you can see still the green line is well below the red one. Then we took an SPDC source, still very nice statistics, but not so highly entangled. The green line is still below. Then we took a quantum dot, badly entangled, super noisy, very birefringent, horrible sampling. However, we still stay below the red line, which is good. And of course now someone might ask, um, so is this scalable? What happens with larger number of qubits? Well, um, first of all, um, we, we, let, let me answer this, this from, from two perspectives. So one is, uh, you, com you can say to me, Anna, you have compared all of this, or let's just let's say only Anna, Dominic, you have compared all of this uh, with, uh, maximum, uh, with maximum likelihood. Are there other better ways to do state reconstruction? So here is semi-definite programming nor L1 norm, semi-definite programming L2 norm, maximum likelihood, maximum entropy. Most of them behaves pretty much either worse or, or equal as a maximum likelihood. So if we show this is better than maximum likelihood, then in principle should be better than the majority of the, of the methods used. And also, when you look at the number of qubits, and here, this comparison, so it's not so easy to do now this for four, five, six, and seven qubits and have Dominic finish his PhD very fast. So we have here just limited to one um, neural network with uh, one quarter of the Pauli operators and compared it for a different number of qubits. As you can see, the neural network approach is still better in all these cases. And I would say it's quite promising. So let me now uh, wrap up and tell you what I have um, shown you to you today. So I showed you two approaches to make um, a source. And we are very proud of this deterministic low Q factor cavities because they're very easy to fabricate. And they have beautiful performance. And I show you how neural networks can help us uh, quantify the entanglement. Of course, I haven't done any of these things single-handedly. So I need to especially here point out Dominic and Miroslav who have done this great work with, uh, Miroslav is my colleague at the uh, Palachki University in Olomouc. It was him and Dominic that started this and then I joined that and we had a lot of fun. It was really great to work on this. Our colleagues in Bristol that did uh, the simulation of the pillars. Uh, Christian and Sven who have helped us a lot with the fabrication. I have realized I don't have Magda's picture. She did a lot of uh, fabrication. She's also from, she worked at many years for, at Würzburg. And of course my group where it was uh, mostly Laia that, did, mo that did, did the characterization of our devices. And of course there's a lot of people that needed to tip in so we can do this.
job. And now, please, if you have any more questions, I'm happy to answer them. But it's also, I can, I can do it. I mean. Me too. <laughs> but I have quite heavy arm. So thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm. What are the, the uh, estimators that your neural network spits out? Like, what are the, the entanglement estimators? What, like, what are the, excuse me, what are the estimators? Uh, like you have the neural network that mm -hmm. you feed the data and mm -hmm. you get a number out of it. Yes. What does that number mean? Like it's a... So, it's direct, so we were going down the analogy with the state tomography. So in the state tomography, you will make, um, you will reconstruct the state and you will have the density matrix. Okay. So this is fine. But from that point on, it's also... Um, a complicated science to estimate the entanglement. So the estimators that we picked were two, and those was concurrence for the two qubit entangled state, or a mutual information, we did it also for two qubit state, but also for a three qubit state where you do mutual information pairwise. And we wanted to go down the same logic because at the end, to estimate the entanglement, you need this number. You don't need a density matrix. So skip the density matrix and have the estimated number being either concurrence or the mutual information. Thanks. More questions? Everyone is now afraid that I'm going to. <laughs> So, um, thank you. Uh, wh were you using some specific architecture for the neural network? Because it seemed to me that you said one was dense and the other was a CNN, no? a convolutional so neural network. They, they are like fully connected networks. And the other one needed to be convolutional because we wanted to have the measurements also as an input. Oh, okay. Okay, it makes sense. Okay. Thanks for the presentation. My question is, on the training you had one, one way to train that was um, a specific measurement, right? Yes. Is there any way to select those measurements based on the data that you used to train? I guess there would be. So I'm just smiling because I kind of put these last five slides on, the, on this uh, Neural networks just based on your CVs, and I see now that all the questions come there. Uh, so, how, how, uh, so you are actually asking me how these points have been made because you, you, out of the 36 measurements, if you take 16, you can pick on many different ways 16 measurements out of 36, right? Yeah, but uh, on measurement specific, I understand that you put some, mm -hmm. some specific measurements and mm -hmm. you see how they perform. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to select those measurements to, to, to guarantee that you will have better performance? I guess you could, but I'm not sure I would dare. Okay, so... Okay, so, I, I'm, so from an experimental point of view, you can... Um, for example, if you know that your measurement apparatus does something silly at some projective measurements, you can try to uh, target to always make the measurements where things are not so silly. So to make it, uh, uh, to back it with the data, uh, look at these jumps here. These, each of these points are five randomly chosen sets of measurements. 
So this is a randomly chosen uh, 20 projective measurements or five randomly chosen 16. They, they are not even the same ones. Okay, so you randomly choose which, and you're not going to train all the neural networks, you're just gonna randomly pick. Okay, I'm gonna do the fi these five combinations. And if you have undersampled data, I expect you're going to get the noise. I could also imagine that this point works better because of the choice of the measurements. Thank you. But it doesn't need to always work. I'm, I'm not really sure that I would like to do it that way. Uh, thank you, thank you for the seminar. Uh, I have a question just back uh, some slides when you have this, this pair of mirrors in, inside there uh, an emitter just yeah more than a few next next one to this uh next one to this one yeah this one yes. uh, so you were stacking uh mirror pairs right mm -hmm. so can you have uh, some dispersive effects like casimir effects between those mirrors and this can affect in a significant way your system or your rate of emitting because i mean you have also these transverse modes mm -hmm. In the CAD, see, they are continuous transferring, transferring momentum. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess you can have some effect, and this can impact your system. I guess maybe yes. I, I never thought about it, never studied it. But I mean, cavity is a cavity. Right. So whatever you can observe in a in a cavity, I guess we we should be able to observe. So I don't know if we would be able to measure, but. I guess it should be there. Okay, right, thank you. More questions? Oh, no. I have a question. <laughs> Tell me something. <laughs> uh, how difficult is, I mean, you have a quantum dot, Yes. a single quantum dot, generate single photons, mm -hmm. right? But if you have two, three, you mm -hmm. can generate a bunch of single photons. That is true. And how difficult it is to synchronize them, to emit, to control them, to, to interfere these single photons. Can you do this in your experiment? How, you, you really like these more quantum dots in the cavity. <laughs> so first of all, you need to tell me how would you put them in there, like all together? No, no, can, can be separated. But in the same but cavity. Then, no, can be different cavities. Yes. So it can be really different systems. Yes. But then one generates a single fault, another one another single fault. But I, I want to have this single fault coming together to interfere in a beam splitter. To do, for instance, a Bosel sampling. No, not complicated because no? the, it, it's a nanosecond. So a, a quantum dot photon is 30 centimeter long. So it's one nanosecond you need to have a precision of a few picoseconds and you're already there. Okay. This is not complicated. But there is a probability of emitting a single photon, perhaps, or no? Well, if you... I mean, you so, have a six, almost 70% of efficiency. Okay, so you, you're, you're not talking about uh, temporal sy synchronization, but synchronizing that they both have an emission. Yes. That goes down the probabilistic approach. Of course, you know what, there is, um, let's go back to not my work. So these microfiller cavities that were used for the boson sampling. So you have their 80% uh, collection efficiency. What I didn't say is that they take only one cascade as well. So 80% becomes 40%. Okay. And then you need to take the photon and then you have to be able to store that photon for a while and get all of these things, all of the cavities to emit and then you release it together, but still it's going to be, be quite probabilistic. You will have an average number of photons, but you will not have the same number of photons. Okay. What they can do and what we can do as well is you can make the cavity to be elliptical and then uh, have all of these beautiful effects for one direction, 
-hmm. and suppress the other. And then you will go from 40% back to 80%. Okay. And then it's easier. Good. OK, thank you. Come. More questions? I guess this is not the case. Let's think again. Thank you.